Okay. Thank you, John. Um, so, our topic tonight is uh, board's role in expansions. And um, Bill and I are prepared to have a um, conversation uh, that walks us through some of the um, some of the important points of of that topic. And during our conversation, we would very much like um, to have your comments and questions. And we'll pause and and really uh, respond directly to them, either as they come in or um, or when we're before we move on to a new uh, a new segment. So please do um, please do send in your your thoughts. Um, this is one of 12 online workshops that we're uh, producing this year as part of the SeaBuild program, and the online workshops are one of four different parts of the SeaBuild program. The other parts are um, ongoing consulting hours with your board, uh, a, a retreat with your board, and the CBL 101 sessions that your um, newly elected or longstanding or general managers, or newly elected directors or longstanding directors can come to, which is a, a, f a foundations class for uh, serving on the board. So there's the um, brief introduction. Before we kind of launch into it, I'd like to introduce Bill Gessner um, as our guest. And Bill has um, been involved in many, many uh, expansion projects and with cooperative development for many years. And Bill, I'd actually like you to, um, if you don't mind, to just share um, a little bit of your of, of your personal background with um, with expansions. Would you Would you do that for us? Sure. Um, I've been doing consulting uh, work with food co-ops uh, through CDS. This is my 21st year. And uh, the primary work I do is assist co-ops in the planning and implementation of expansion projects. I probably work primarily with the general manager, but uh, I also do work and have interaction with and am involved with the board of directors from time to time. And uh, I've probably worked with over 200 food co-ops around the country in that span of time in some phase of an expansion project. And I view my, what I bring to my consulting work is I think an understanding of the process that is somewhat unique to cooperatives in trying to expand or relocate um, you know, the food co-op, either expanding at the current site or expanding through relocation or expanding by adding additional stores. And those are very challenging projects. And um, there's a lot of sp specific technical expertise required to get through that. And I have some awareness of that, some experience with the, the different aspects of, of it technically. But I think more generally, I have a good sense of the process of how it works, uh, both from a the business point of view and the organizational point of view. So prior to doing the consulting work, I managed at the retail level a very small co-op many years ago, and then also managed a uh, uh, worker-owned wholesale cooperative uh, for a number of years. So that's my background. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. Um, I just had a late breaking submission here of what makes expansion special. Fear of the unknown. So we see the implication with the question is that expansions are special, <laughs> right? Um, and I really like these these answers have have uh, really show kind of the breadth of uh, of of what makes them special. They are they uh, they really do conjure up uh, the unknown, and yet they. Um, oftentimes are all about community and and dealing with um, all different levels of the organization. And I think that hopefully that that will be um, uh, actually kind of illustrating that in our uh, in our topic tonight. So um, question coming in from uh, 
Susie, the co-ops that are uh, participating in the session are from all over the country, from uh, California to Arkansas to uh, Wisconsin, uh, pretty much all across uh, all across the NCGA region. All right, um, I had circulated an article um, or had suggested that that you take a look at this article that we've been working on um, on the role of board of directors in expansion project, and um, uh, it's available on the um, in our file repository for for um, for the session, and it's it's organized around these three clusters of of words. Um, learn, listen, and lead, commitment, engagement, and alignment, and control, delegate, and evaluate. And we're going to kind of just step through these clusters um, tonight as our, as our process, um, and uh, hopefully that they will, they will all come together as the, the, um, as, a, as the whole idea of the board's role in expansions. Um, so we're going to get right in here to um, um, this first idea. This is actually kind of the broader um, the broader thought that that um, encompasses all of them is is that directors need to work together. Um, they need to have a way of working together, which we describe as a strong governance system. And that the expansion time is is one when you really do want to excel at your job. You want to do it very well. Um, and what's interesting about uh, about that is um, since expansions kind of by definition take um, time. We can uh, we'll talk about that in a second. And since directors come and go by structure that we have board elections. Uh, it's very uh, useful to even imagine that we'll have different directors serving in the governance position while the expansion process, maybe not one project, but the overall development process uh, in a co-op might be taking place. So this is this idea of working together over a long time and really talking about um, or having a quality as a group that, that, you can, that you can do a good job as a group is, is really essential. Um, and Bill, any you want to chime in on that idea before we dive into any uh, any details? Well, I, I look at it as um, these projects take uh, a good amount of time, both in the planning and the implementation, and then once the co-op has opened in its expanded state, there's a, that's when you know the real challenging work begins, and there's the first year or two or three after that. So it's pretty easy to look at a span of six years uh, encompassing the planning and implementation and follow through of a project. And I kind of say that it, that uh, that board members need to be thinking of that span of time. And if you can be a good board member, that you will be needed for <laughs> a, a length of time like And so we have up here uh, a slide that's showing um, some of those phases. So, so when we're talking about years. The years then break down into parts, um, and that each of these parts kind of represents a different phase of a of a project. But from a director's point of view, just I think getting that sense of 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 um, the time continuum. So that hey, what we're working on right now is just like this moment, but really this thing is going to go on for for some time. And and I even have, have now started thinking thinking of it as a development culture of just thinking of how how can we uh, as directors um, view our the the community that we're that we're governing that we're the responsibilities that we have how can we view that as one that is dynamic that does change over time kind of kind of by definition and uh, and that an expansion project is really you know going to have everybody's focus uh, to be successful but that really a cooperative might be a very dynamic uh, organization you know with change on an ongoing basis um, and in that sense uh, <coughs> expansion is 
is become becomes a, a system in the co-op just like you know some of the operating systems mm -hmm. and you know probably half of the food co-ops um, today are in some phase of planning or implementing or just having completed an expansion project mm -hmm. and so they seem to cycle through you know at least every five years <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and so it's uh, it is an ongoing part of our our cooperative organizations. Mm -hmm. And Bill, since this slide that shows the four stages um, is here on the screen right now, I mean, would you and and we're going to kind of leave it um, doesn't really come back um, d during the slide set. But would you just talk about decision points for a minute uh, regarding the the three the three stages and how? That you know, and that how that there are decision points and how to prepare for right. that a little bit. Yeah, for the existing food co-ops, there there are four stages uh, for these projects, and you see them there. The stage one and stage two are probably what are most important to understand in terms of the process and the distinction between them. Uh, stage one being feasibility stage, where you're uh, beginning to look at a scenario or scenarios and to see if any of them might be feasible. And rather than just say, oh, I think that looks good or That's, uh, I, I've got a gut feeling that that will work, that you want to, as an organization, develop a systematic approach to, to, uh, to assessing feasibility. And so that that's the prime focus in stage one. And the end of stage one happens when you secure a site, either by a lease or a purchase agreement, and that you secure a site contingent upon. And so with contingencies, and the, the primary contingency that almost encompasses all the others is the financing contingency. So that you would secure a site contingent upon getting financing within you might like to have 90 days or 120 days or as many days as you can get. And the property owner or landlord like, might like to give you two weeks. And so <laughs> the, uh, you know, the push-pull is, is on there and you need to try to get as much time as you can uh, to go into stage two. But so you, so you see that there's a decision point at the end of stage one. There are also probably a number of decision points, I always suggest three or four, or something like that, during stage one itself. And so when you begin to think of the concept of decision points, the very first decision point, you're saying, let's get together and begin to explore expanding our co-op. And people might be anxious about that, and board members might be nervous or anxious not wanting to do that. Um, part of the anxiety comes from feeling like it's making the final decision. And I always mm -hmm. try to clarify that there are a series of decision points, kind of stepping stones or like a ladder that you go up. And that first step or that, that first point is important, and you begin kind of putting resources at risk uh, as you begin to go down the path of trying to investigate and, and learn more and to determine if your plan is feasible in a systematic way. Mm -hmm. And so there might be three, four, or five decision points in stage one, and then you go into stage two, and then you really begin spending money. You've spent a fair amount of money probably to get through stage one, but in stage two, the you do the more complete design work and you launch your member loan drive and your financing to get bank financing and hopefully that all comes together at the end of stage two and where it's not shown here on this on the screen but at the end of stage two is another very major decision point and it's the it's what i call the final decision point it's the no turning back point so if you go through the four stage points in stage one and maybe a couple decision points in stage two, 
each time you're building your level of commitment and you're taking on more risk, putting more resources at risk, uh, coming together, leadership of the co-op and saying, is this, do we still want to, what we know, do we want to do with our plan? And for and at the end of stage two, uh, once you make that decision, remove the contingencies of your lease agreement, close on all your bank financing, sign with your contractor. You know, there ain't no turning back. Then you're there. <laughs> and you're there. And, and the thing about understanding the difference between stage one and stage two is it's so important as because you're – your co-op's individual unique project will do everything it can to resist this template of force. And so you, it's your job to try to say what stage are we in, what are the remaining items we need to do in stage one before we can move on to stage two. Uh -huh. Rather than say, oh, well, we're in part of stage one and we're somewhere halfway there and then we're going into stage two and and before you know it, you've signed a lease without any contingencies and you don't have your financing and you're going backwards. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose of a roadmap like this. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> um, so when I hear that and I think of it, you know, really from the, from the director's point of view, um, now I see that that the director has these two jobs. One is, the, you know, we, we really do want to be uh, somewhat visionary and thinking about the future, and we'll get to that in a minute. And then we also need to be judging uh, the the work that's going on on our behalf. And so you really are um, uh, trying to make sure that, okay, does does the work process that I'm observing, does it make sense? Have I Am I seeing this uh, continuity in uh, in steps? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and uh, you know the it's a balance between you know having building a shared vision as you're as you're beginning the process, and then not being you know too attached to any specific vision that you have early on but yet you're you're trying to develop commitment within the group and you're trying to move forward and so at any one time you might have a plan a and you might be putting that to the test and seeing if that's feasible and if you can get through the hurdles and over the hurdles and through the barriers right. uh, 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 and so but you know you might trip and fall uh, for reasons beyond your control or for reasons within your control. And then you might have to start over and you might have to go to a plan B or, mm -hmm. you know, things can happen. Or you get more information and find out that you thought what well, your plan A that you thought was so great really isn't feasible because of A, B, and C. And uh, then you need to kind of go back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Um you know, through all the trip and fall and, and uh, A, B, and C, um, what I also try and help a board do is see that, well, all that is going on, and in fact, the board could be doing some work that isn't directly tied into all of that activity um, because it's all consuming in a way in terms of uh, uh, types of information that could, uh, you know, maybe – probably could have a better phrase, but suck you into that ups and downs and ups and downs. Um, and I like to really help a board see that, okay, you could actually have a role here that's a step above a lot of that activity so that you can be very consistent in your approach and work, even though there's this, you know, much more dynamic level that's working under you with all of the, you know, plan A, B, C, yeah. You know, we have to have alignment and clarity, uh, you know, and be connected, and yet we all don't have to be doing all of that same, doing the same work. Yeah, it's important that the board not be knocked off its center, mm -hmm. you know. Good, yeah. It's nice. going through an extension okay. process. And so the board has limited time to do its work, and it's uh, 
keep its primary focus on its governance function, and I would assume that you know giving clear direction to management and for management to be coming back to the board at appropriate times with reporting and recommendations and mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. Hey, Bill, I just wanted to show this. Um, this slide that's up right now is uh, was included in the Co-op Grocer article. Um, uh, maybe it was, I forget now which issue it is, but um, oh, silly me, a couple months ago. And um, we, we were uh, talking about assets as stuff and liabilities as debt, stuff that comes from outside and equity as stuff that comes from inside and how that um, changes over time. And we had three scenarios um, or, or galleries, we called them in the article. And, and, and this is one of them. And it, it, um, we put it in there on purpose as showing, you know, a co-op over a period of, of years growing its stuff. And in fact, in this case, tripling its stuff. Um, and the idea of building equity and then using the equity to take on uh, more debt and having more stuff and then building some more equity and and um, and growing that way and yet um, this shows you know uh, three kind of three projects or three um, three kind of expansions in, in a way in nine years and um, and I suppose it's you know every co-op is really different right Bill but is that is this was this an unrealistic picture uh, did, do you think in terms of that kind of putting three things in nine years like this? Well, does it show three in nine years or is it actually two in nine years? Yeah, okay. The way I would, yep. the way I would look at it is in year four there's an expansion and year seven there's an expansion. Yep, okay, yep. Uh, but uh, that's I think that's realistic, certainly. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would look typically as a five-year interval between projects, but it, it certainly can be as little as three years. And yep. Can be longer, so. Mm -hmm. And what I liked about this this gallery concept of using the balance sheet was that it it did you know imply that that you know there is a dynamic uh, energy in the in the co-op and um, you know and and here we're we're seeing a co-op growing uh, its 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 earnings and its its member equity and then taking on you know more debt in order to make this change in in its you know its stuff or its presence in the world and that those changes between say what's in year one and four and then seven really are um, are are really shows a strong strong growth and in my mind a real intention about being in a development model yeah and and in this um, drawing our, our member loans viewed as uh, in the red, or are they in the? Might they be viewed in the equity? I would assume they're in the red in this. Yeah, drawing. I think they're in the red in this model. Yeah, so it would be interesting to see the same thing with the member loan portion. Because uh, what you, what you would say is that part of this red right here in year four would be member loan money. Yeah, which is a which is subordinate, which is a quasi form of equity. Right. You know, it, it's subordinate to the primary bank debt. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it would be interesting to see another drawing like this with another line that would show the member loan portion in the equity. Mm -hmm. Nice. So um, I would encourage you to, and, and I'll, I'll put a PDF file of this, uh, of the balance sheet article in the file repository for the workshop, but, um, and, and, it's, and its intent is really just to, teach the idea of looking at the balance sheet but if you uh, if you're reading it from a say a development uh, point of view it, it um, um, uh, might might even take on a little more meaning uh, let's see this next slide we touched on a little bit this the idea of the of the um, um, well actually here's a, a question from from Tom and the question is is this a typical balance sheet for a successful expansion project um, when we made there were there were three there were three uh, pictures made for the article and um, and when we put this one together we we did think of it kind of as the classic 
uh, expansion picture. What do you think about that, Bill? I didn't ever ask you your opinion. <laughs> no, you didn't. Oh, uh, or did I? <laughs> no, you didn't. Uh, you know, I would look like in year four there, uh, typically the the red might be three times what the green is. Uh-huh. Or three, three yeah, and I think that's times. meant to be a two-to-one relationship there in year four. Yeah, and, and I would see it going higher in many cases, and I often look at saying that, you know, it would not want the debt-to-equity ratio not to exceed three-and-a-half to one. Uh-huh. Uh, this is a more conservative picture of two-to-one. Uh, yeah, it would be nice if you can get it, but uh, in most expansion projects, at least, you know, that initial type of thing where you're often tripling your retail space, mm-hmm. you know, it, it ends up it's oftentimes hard to contain it within the three to one mm-hmm. uh, level, and so that's a that's a high level of debt. Certainly, a portion of that debt is member loan debt. Uh, if you get if you move that member loan portion down into the equity thing, right. then maybe the ratio might be two and a half to one. Mm-hmm. So this actually the the line here, red might be. Um, I was trying to figure out how to make that. It's probably something like that then. Uh, yeah, that's about a little, little bit more than three deep. and a half to one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. if you're getting it. Yeah. All right, great question. Thanks, Tom. Um, well, let's see. There's actually one more. Won't well, really have the. Is three times retail space a common amount to shoot for in a, in a relocation expansion? Hmm. Well, it, it has been probably. Uh, on the average over the years, but in, increasingly as the market is maturing, that's and maybe you, the co-op has been through a major expansion five years ago. It might not necessarily triple again, but that first major expansion might easily be a tripling. Uh, I wouldn't encourage it to be anything more than that, just in terms of capacity. But uh, the if if you simply if your if your current store is very crowded and both for customers and staff, and you simply double the space. You can it allows you to widen the aisle. Uh, pretty soon you'll be jam packed again. So the, the the bang for your buck has been you know a tripling is is good, but that subject should be subject to a market analysis mm-hmm. that needs to be supported by a market analysis certainly. Right. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, that was a fun little balance sheet tangent. Um, Back to the idea of uh, shared vision and a board um, providing leadership um, and clear alignment with management uh, probably answers part of the question of what's the right type of project for us to take on. Um, I like to uh, have this very um, simple picture that is uh, very challenging, I think, for um, for us to really work with. But it's like, if if here we are now, and we look back and say that 30 years ago, um, uh, between then and now, we can see that a bunch of change happened. Um, looking ahead, uh, change is going to happen. And now the question is, as as a group of of, of uh, board leaders. How do we picture this change? How do we help influence the change? And what is it that we're what is it that we're trying to create? Um, those are questions in my mind that the board um, can really work work on and work on and work on and work on with its members and with its management. And um, and then as the answers um, become more clear, what expansion plans? Um, will be necessary uh, will make more and more sense, um, and and this this question of um, uh, as a result of all of our efforts and programs and activities, including uh, expansions, <laughs> um, we will have X, Y, and Z. Um, this is a question that that a board really needs to spend time on, in my opinion. And um, 
will help inform the, the, the planning process. Um, Bill, any any uh, any comments from you on this? Uh, what is it that we're here for? I I think the the process of building a shared vision uh, that that certainly rolls into that and and you know I encourage as part of, uh, building a shared vision doesn't happen overnight or at a one day retreat but it happens over a period of time yeah but I think you need to ask this kind of question and put forth some answers and then critique and look at those if they really is that really what you what you want right what you want the result and uh, that's just part of the the dialogue that's involved in in building a shared vision right yeah Dave uh, from Weaver's way just wrote why why expand needs to precede where expand and um, yes and um, I I think that the the why expand question though lasts a really long time so it's not like it keeps changing in my mind it's it's um, like lately I've been reflecting back uh, 30 years when people couldn't get uh, access to bulgur and tofu and they and they were saying you know we want access to bulgur and tofu and so a lot happened since then you know um, producers came into being and distribution models and we learned how to be retailers and and um, and all of it really was in response to a really a simple, clear, hey, we just need access. <laughs> right. So I wasn't in any of those retreats 30 years ago. Were you, Bill? Oh, I probably was. Probably yeah. were, yeah. Is that what they were asking? How do I get my bulgur? Yes, and, and it's, it has shifted now. You know, those products are often available elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but... You know what was a byproduct of that effort to get vulgar. You know, a, a community was born out of that effort, and now, in, in many ways, I see an equal hunger for community yeah. as there was for vulgar. You know, 30 years ago, and yet you can't, you can't. It's kind of hard to. It's a, it's a it's more subtle type of thing, and it's hard to focus on it as a specific end. But uh, community is a is a, is a, I think a desired end. Um, you know. Yeah, it came up on our what makes expansion special, community, mm -hmm. and yeah. um, and I think that when boards actually, um, you know don't focus on a project but more about why are we here the idea of community really comes up and that's one of the reasons why I really like the idea of, of not having the board's conversations completely centered on projects is because it's so easy for us to actually get hooked on the project and and you know the shape of the tables or the square footage of something rather and and to not, you know, kind of distance ourselves from actually the more difficult conversation of, well, you know, what what is, uh, uh, you know, how do we talk about community? How do we lead for for a community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it's, I think those questions are extremely important. You know, what is the, you know, and in, in, in many ways, uh, cooperatives are. Community organizing right. organizations, and the there's a community organizing process is a big part of an expansion project. Mm -hmm. Right, and and so really getting grounded and knowing what it is where you where your co-op sits in terms of its role in the community as a center or center of community, a source for community. Uh, a model, um, you know, those are, are big questions. Yep. Um, so speaking of big questions, learn, listen, and lead. That sounds like we should have a lot of questions uh, for learning and listening and then leading based on um, what it is that we're learning and hearing. Um, I'm just going to show you a picture that we've found to be useful um, in talking about this idea of 
the board having its own work plan that isn't project oriented, but it's more of this: how do we how do we get to this conversation about why um, we're here and what's important for our our co-op today and and in the future that we can see. Um, and let's see, this might just take a second to come up. It's um, it's a picture that in the middle has uh, has policies. These, this, the language in this chart very much uh, is, is uh, policy governance oriented, but um, but if you view it more loosely, you'll just see that um, the board um, we would we would expect that you would have um, some policies, and the bottom chart here is having to do with delegation and accountability as it relates to the management um, with ongoing operations. Uh, or a, and or a special project, and the um, and the top part of this um, of this chart, which I have a bigger um, picture of coming up here, is is really saying, hey, now that we have some ideas about why we're here, um, what if we spend time reflecting on them, learning about them by identifying uh, important things that are going on in the world. As it relates to the um, outcomes that we've that we've um, defined for the co-op, and then come up here into uh, what we call a study and engagement um, period, which is really about how does the board actively um, engage in the conversation about uh, about community or about the future, about what our what the important uh, conditions are in the world that, as we represent our members, we should be uh, grappling with. The word engagement implies that it really is a process that is meant to be um, uh, done with others, whether it's um, experts or members, um, but that it's not really meant for the for the board just to be um, doing its its uh, its its leadership process uh, entirely on its own. And and uh, and you come out of this again. Your product is policies, and you're coming back down here to this place in the middle where the management is really reflecting and responding to um, what the board has has written down. And th this this wheel, in my mind, is this this how you know it's it's just how do we get to this um, this. How do we create a structure to allow for this conversation about what's important for our community, right? What's important for the future of our of our co-op, and um, it it is really different from the project um, from the project management, and in my mind, this is the work that results in in policies and expectations that allow for the planning process and for policy or, or uh, planning process and projects to really. Um, happen then within a context that not only the board but also the members can really understand. Um, and as we get into commitment, engagement, and alignment, um, our next three words: um, alignment on a project based on a context that makes sense to everyone. All right. So, should we just go to commitment, engagement, and alignment, Bill? Yes. Excellent. Um, Bill, why is commitment such an important aspect in an expansion project? <laughs> Glad to see you have it bolded there. Uh, I, I think it's it's important to look at and kind of isolate commitment, assess it, and, and say how committed are you as individual as an individual leader of the co-op and how committed are you as a leadership group um to exploring and pursuing expansion for your co-op uh, and sometimes it takes a long time to get that commitment level to a certain point uh, I often say getting the commitment level of the group to be an inch off the ground and that's cause for celebration when you get to that point and you're kind of all engaged and aligned and but committed and uh, and then 
going forward, you need to continue to assess your commitment level and you need to continue to intentionally raise the commitment because if it just stays at that inch to the ground, you flatten out and you will lose the energy and the momentum that that you need you know to to go through a project mm-hmm. but just doing some self analysis on your own individual commitment level and commitment level of the group and you know if you're not committed don't you don't punish yourself it, it's but it's to understand and say what's your motivation and you know why are you are you motivated are you are you committed in this direction and if not let's say why not there might be a good reason why not uh-huh. but uh, so I'm not saying lack of commitment is bad. And and Bill, when you when you talk about commitment, are you talking about commitment to a certain a certain project, or even on a broader level, commitment to say the development culture, the development, you know, the dynamics of a development culture? Well, that that would be great, you know, if if to to, to acknowledge such a culture and to have a an individual and group commitment to such, you know, in your organization. Mm-hmm. And it, committing to a culture like that is, allows you not to be committed to one, to an end, not to be attached to an end outcome. So how do you cultivate commitment without getting attached? Right. It is the balancing, you know, the challenge to balance that. Uh-huh. Uh, and, uh, so you can't get attached to an end outcome on day one of your project, but you can begin to develop your commitment, you know, to the to the path to the process. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the the a um, uh, couple of questions would come in very much related. One is, uh, how does a commitment for an expansion project differ from the commitment and raw energy that was required for a new startup co-op? And and the other uh, question that's very much uh, uh, in my mind similar is that this idea of um, do we need to really understand why we would um, be doing a project <laughs> before we um, you know before we do a project and and the then the why is the is the big why you know like um, what are the desired outcomes of our organization and how do we think about the future of our community and the co-op's relationship with that um, future? Yeah. yeah. Well, those are very important questions and to, to understand and to gain an understanding and be able to answer why you would want to do an expansion project. But I don't think you know necessarily know those answers at the beginning of what I refer to as expansion planning. Right. Yeah. So I don't, I don't say, okay, I, I, I wouldn't recommend saying, okay, let's, Let's wait a year before, so that we can get clear on these questions about why we would want to expand. Mm-hmm. I would say that answering those questions is part of the expansion planning process. Mm-hmm. And, uh, if, and if you were to, and the way I heard that is is almost on the project level. And if you were to expand out to the development culture, in my mind, the board's ongoing conversations, that whole um, study and engagement process is really designed to be um, in a in an iterative fashion exploring those questions like forever that's actually besides uh, being a good judge of how plans are developed and implemented by management the other role of the board is really to be asking these questions on an ongoing basis not just when there's a project coming up and in fact in my mind more important I mean, the the best gift that a board could give to its members and its management would be to really be grappling with these things all the time, especially before a project is happening. On an ongoing basis, yeah. On an ongoing basis, yeah. That sounds good. I mean, there's so much change in our world today and then in a specific industry, uh, the natural foods industry, and uh, cooperatives are seeking to be change agents in their in their communities and in the world. So uh, a development culture sounds like a good thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet I really, uh, it's interesting just to have the um, River Valley Market Startup 
down the street here from me in Northampton, which was a new startup, and to see that they really, you know, held the vision over, uh, you know, years, and it was that shared vision that really fueled their success, uh, successful opening, uh, you know, right. among many, you know, lots of support and lots of community development, um, and you know, I I think that if uh, if uh, ongoing co-op could have, you know, nurture that sense of shared vision and raw energy, you know, who knows what's possible. Yeah. Um, in that, you know, in that case, uh, their initial vision and what they ended up with was certainly probably different in, in some respects. Um, mm -hmm. Yet the, the visioning process that they went through and the, you know, the, the specific scenarios that they attempted and tried to pursue and you know, all of that led to you know building their 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 vision that they that they've now realized by opening a store. Yeah. Um, but the the type of I go back to this. I, I like the idea, Mark, of what you're saying in terms of you know, an ongoing development culture. Um, but I would say that if you if there's not an ongoing development culture in your organization, that you don't necessarily need to say, okay, we're going to take a year or two years to develop a, a development culture before we right. start a yep. project. Yeah, so especially I, on a – go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. My definition of an expansion project is broad enough to encompass that early, you know, developing – creating a development culture in the organization mm -hmm. and develop – asking some of these tough questions and not being attached to it. Not being set on, you know, we're going to expand come hell or high water. I mean, that's not what you declare when you enter stage one of a feasibility stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. And then sometimes the business is just growing at such a pace that the answer of why do we need to do this is just so apparent based on what's going on inside the store. <laughs> right? The uh, the line at the checkout or the line at the deli or the non-existent deli um, can you know, be, is yeah. is the vision and mission of your co-op to serve the broader community, and is that is serving the broader community part of serving your the needs of your current members? Mm -hmm. uh, I would any of our food co-ops the needs of our current members include serving the broader community. So that, in my way of thinking, can be a, kind of a foundation piece to building that that development culture. Mm -hmm. Let's talk for a minute about this uh, last question on this page. This, if an expansion project takes years to play out, how does the board stay connected to its past commitment? I find that to be really fascinating because, um, you know, a challenge of, of, of a board is to is to have the uh, kind of in, be able to institutionalize its its uh, previous actions and and have directors you know a couple years down the road be able to take advantage of the work of the sitting board. Um, what what comments do you have on that, Bill? Well, I think there will be change and turnover in the board over time, but I think it's really helpful to try to build a you know the the a critical mass of good board members who are committed to you know to seeing a taking the co-op to a new level and seeing that through and I think that's a, a six year commitment and you know a, a three year board term you know two three year terms yeah. uh, uh, minimally and uh, so but if if only you know, one or two board members are going to survive that 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 span of time. Uh, that's going to put a real stress and challenge on the on the governance system. And so, it would really need a sound process that is not personality dependent, right. but where it can create policy and and have effective monitoring and effective board management relationship right. without you know, a, a personality dependent situation. Mm -hmm. But but the ideal I think is in a nine person board to have, you know, five people that can be We're gonna still be there. Yep. 
and be there over a six-year span. Right. And then you're still going to have plenty of new people coming in yep. uh, and adding, you know, uh, to the board. Mm -hmm. So then, so then it's just that aging and memory loss question. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, no excuses about not being on the board uh, if if you're you've been there the whole five years. Yeah. Um, if you if you can't if you can't do the job and you can't be an effective board member, I, I'm not suggesting you try to stay on for six years. Yeah. So. And um, and then uh, before we uh, move off of this particular slide, this um, this idea of um, th this question really came up from conversations that that Bill and I have had, where it seems like oftentimes um, the the funds of evaluating, assessing uh, expansion projects uh, oftentimes aren't aren't um, aren't put up uh, in a manner that allows for the whole scope of the project to be considered. And so, Bill, just what what do you what what do you put in the uh, in the hopper when you think of uh, the whole scope of the project and um, committing resources? What is that? The, that's a market analysis. It's um, getting a review of the financial performance. What what all is in, in that uh, category? Well, in terms of looking at the big picture of what the project is, and, and especially in the feasibility stage as you're trying to assess feasibility, I, I say there are at least four primary components of feasibility so that you're not just going to say, oh, let's do a feasibility study, mm -hmm. but but look at feasibility in four specific areas, um, and I, I list those as market feasibility, uh, internal readiness, uh, second, uh, third, financial feasibility, and fourth, design feasibility. Mm -hmm. That they're necessarily done in that sequence, but I still somehow like that. That I still like that as a as a way to list them. Yeah. And and the um, so doing a kind of assessments in each of those specific areas and saying is your expansion plan A feasible in those areas and and then so if you're able to let's say check off all four, then integrate that together for an overall feasibility assessment. Or you might say that. Well, we're strong in three of those, but the fourth one, this particular project, is it's a little bit weak in. These are the things that we need to do to address the weaknesses and strengthen it. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's it, it's a it's a fatal weakness that we we really can't move forward. Mm -hmm. So, what I mean by a systematic approach to assessing feasibility, um, and and I think that's a a way to look at the the whole scope of the project. Um, a, 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 another way to answer that question is, I like a you know a sources and uses budget as a illustrative one-page photograph of a project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I realize it's not the total thing, but it, it really helps people once they understand what what that sources and uses budget is and they begin to see the full scope of the project that way. Mm -hmm. And so if you were coaching uh, management, you would be saying, hey, let's, uh, let's make sure that you're doing proper feasibility in all areas and you have the right financial uh, oversight tools like the sources and use. And then to the board, we're saying, hey, you ought to be able to judge um, whether or not uh, feasibility is is adequate or being planned for properly the way your manager is presenting to you um, in these areas, for example. Is that? Um, yeah. I mean, because the, the manager is really going to be the one who's going to be doing this work in terms of 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 building uh, the capacity that you are describing in those areas or understanding all that information. From the board's point of view, they want to be able to judge whether or not that's happening and happening at the appropriate level. Yeah, and, and to be able to then say, okay, we're at the end of stage one, and, and we have management that's reporting that we have a project that appears feasible from these four different points of view, and we're ready to move into stage two with the understanding that this is what the costs and the risk might be 
to move into stage two and to try to get us to the final decision point. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and and so typically the stage one is in some ways the more complex stage to work your way through, but stage two can be you know, very challenging and very costly. And while you might be able to declare you have a project at the end of stage one, things might surface in stage two that means that you don't get to the end of stage two, but you, what you do have is a valuable education. Yeah, and we like that, being well-educated. <laughs> that's, that's why it's a co-op principle, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Um, and a fair question came in, and that was, uh, what is the sources and use budget? And, um, and, and the answer is, is that that is a, um, uh, that is a, um, a financial tool that shows cash uh, coming into a project and, and how it's going to be used in a project. Uh, listing of all the uses and uh, listing of all the sources, and they kind of balance out, and some of the key assumptions would also be yeah. stated yeah. on that as a one pager. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, uh, that becomes the, the you know the cover page for a financial performa. The financial performa will tell you whether what's laid out in the sources and uses is it is financially viable. Right. The source uses statement is not a, a, does not assess financial feasibility in itself. Right. And another fair comment came in. Uh, uh, I'm still not clear. A lot of this sounds operational, and I agree that some of that was um, really going to be happening on the other side of the fence, you might say. And yet, um, under the umbrella of commitment, um, it's important that everybody kind of gets. Uh, what we're talking about that, you know, Bill was describing um, plan A, B, C, and D, and that there's a lot of dynamic movement in terms of, you know, how things actually might shake out, and that oh, through, you know, this whole five-year process that a project might take to actually come to fruition, that um, that th there needs to be this, this uh, strong sense of commitment between the board and management and ultimately also upstream from the board to the members that, hey, we understand why we're going through this and we understand, um, you know, uh, that, that, you know, the path is not clear and that things change and things turn out differently than what we first expected and yet commitment is, is sound. And um, I don't know, some of that, I think some of the tests to commitment probably happen on the management side in terms of moving targets and um, and so it's just important a little bit to understand like what the heck the management's working with over there, right? Right, and, and you know at the at the board level though, I think there are times when a, when a board is going to be tested for its level of commitment. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know that might be, I mean, a lot of you know boards just for organization to spend first. Five hundred dollars or five thousand dollars on an expansion project is a big test, and that in many costs that might be an operational decision. But uh, a lot of times, I see it. I see the board, you know, signing off on that, and that's a that's a test of initial commitment. Yeah. Or you know, going back, putting a dollar amount on this um, on this middle question: uh, What does it take to feel comfortable? to be accountable for committing resources. I mean, it might be a $50,000 commitment of, of co-op resources, and we really want to go, okay, in fact, Bill, you just finished with, uh, and it might have just all been for our education, and yet how do we, you know, how do we stay in, in alignment that this is actually the process that we're going through and that it's going to lead us to hopefully what we, what we want, even though, you know, it's not clear. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. Yeah. There's risk at the very beginning, and you know what's what's your comfort level with that? Mm -hmm. With take risk. Mm -hmm. Good, nice comment. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, so let's get into engagement. Um, uh, I have one, two, three, four, five, five different uh, relationships here regarding engagement, and um, um, you know, 
f first of all, this board and member engagement, in my mind, doesn't begin with being centered around a project. Though, as Bill's saying, gee, if a project comes up, it's don't don't you know put off the project discussion. Um, but if you don't have a project on your horizon, I think that you can still say, hey, part of our responsibility is to be engaged with our members in a way that allows for uh, development to occur at the co-op. And then that's really beneficial later when you have projects uh, emerging because then you can actually um, be demonstrating, hopefully, that your projects are in alignment with, um, with the things that the board has set out as important for the co-op's future and um, ought to be done uh, in conjunction with member input and engagement. Um, but let's talk a little bit about uh, about the board and the GM engagement, Bill. Yeah, well, I, I think that's where it, everything kind of hinges on that, that relationship. And, and a lot of the work I do with co-ops that are in the expansion planning mode and, you know, you really need to be able to take a look at that relationship and say, is that a strong and effective relationship and is there appropriate level of support? Uh, this primary support is from board to GM, but it's, there's, it's two ways. Uh, and, and if that, you know, if, if looking at this from a detached assessment point of view, you could say, well, that's, it's not very strong in our co-op and, you know, then, but we're going to try to move ahead on our expansion project nevertheless. Uh, I would say nevertheless, it's, it's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and to, acknowledge that and to deal with it, not in a blaming way, but to, you know, to build and strengthen that relationship because everything emanates from that. Mm -hmm. So, the, so if you're the board, you're saying, how do we, um, how do we really have the best relationship with our manager possible and, uh, and same from the GM's point of view and then how, I mean, again, what I like about the conversation is stretching out a project like this over a period of years or even even framing it in this development culture uh, terminology of saying, hey, let's actually create a relationship that can survive dynamic uh, development. Um, what does that look like? How do we stay connected um, through, you know, through an ongoing process like that? Mm -hmm. And uh, I suggest you, you know, that's a great conversation. And uh, even if you think that you have a relationship uh, that is already sound, just like putting it on the table and doing an assessment of like, okay, what's it take? You know, do we have policies? Do we have procedures? Do we have ways to check each other? Um, you know, can we be honest with each other? It's that whole group group dynamic uh, question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Yeah, if you can do that in a in an open and comfortable way, that's very healthy. Uh -huh. so. um, this engagement with the GM and members, um, what I see happening is management having member engagement uh, programs to inform their planning process, um, or you know somehow having member input at some level on on uh, what's unfolding. So that when plans emerge and projects emerge, there's you know member there has been member participation at some level. Um, that seems to be helpful in some cases. Is, do you see that as, as common, Bill, or recommended, or what? Well, I think that the boards and co-ops struggle with that, uh, and it is confusing and challenging in a project where sometimes there there's requirements for confidentiality. Oh yeah around real estate issues and, you know, where is the store going to, where is the co-op going to move to and da 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 And so I think I, I suggest you go back to that, looking at the four stages timeline for an expansion project and, and utilize, recognize the difference between stage one and stage two. And so that, you know, a, a site could not be, should not be publicly uh, discussed in stage one, but once the site is secured, 
with contingencies at the end of stage one and going into stage two, then you can you have a time to have you know specific dialogue with your members about that specific site. Uh -huh. Prior prior to stage two, you can have dialogue with your members about about you know this development culture, right. uh, expansion in general, and you know the the vision, building a shared vision for your co-op going forward. Right. Uh, uh, but you you do have to be very careful about not disclosing specific sites because we've seen complications can happen. Uh, so. Yep, makes sense. Um, can I answer the question, why is engagement essential by suggesting that that's how we develop a shared vision? <laughs> and that's how we develop uh, um, commitment? Yeah, I, I think so. I think the, the, the last of your bulleted items under what does engagement look like, the last one where you're talking about engagement with the project, uh, to me, that's important in, in that, you know, you can envision scenarios in different co-ops where either the board is not engaged in the project and it's all being left to the general manager right. or the general manager is, you know, too busy unloading the truck and so the board's going to do the project and the general manager isn't engaged or, you know, the board and G GM are just working at this together. They're engaged, but the members haven't been engaged. And yeah. so... Uh, to me, it's in, you know engagement with the project, and, and specifically for the board to be engaged with the project, but to understand that they're not necessarily rolling up their sleeves and you know doing hands-on work in terms of determining where the store is going to be located and negotiating the lease, and or hopefully even not even what size it is, because that's where you lose me, <laughs> as you know. Yeah. Being, uh, so, go ahead. Yeah. But but so the challenge. So what I see sometimes in the board and their interest in not being in in a, involved in a micromanagement way is that they have such a hands-off role that they're that they're not engaged with the project. Yeah. Gotcha. And the project will suffer. You know, and the co-op will suffer right. from that. I like this. Um, in the uh, in the article, um, we conjured up the idea of a of a board member running into a member at a street corner, and you know the member has like those basic common sense questions about you know how the plans fit with the co-op's future and what the risks are, and you know, gee, can we really do this? And and um, and how did we end up with these you know with these uh, with with this particular future? And I really like the idea of directors being able to answer those questions and yet uh, probably, you know, well, definitely not with the type of depth that the manager is going to have after, you know, obviously being in the in the thick of it for um, the whole time. But I like the idea of like running into the member or or even just addressing the members in an organized fashion at a, at a, at a member meeting, uh, directors being able to to really address these address these issues because they they are really involved, and yet not at all on a management level, really. Yeah, and so for the board to be, you know, engaged and aligned, so the leadership of the co-op is aligned, you know, there's alignment between board and management, and then the board as a whole is able to go forth and engage with the members, uh, you know, showing support for this direction. Uh, as opposed to the board going to the members and saying, hey, members, you know, we're having a little difficult time figuring this out. It's kind of complicated. What do you think we should do? Mm -hmm. um, no, I really think, it, you know, the board needs to wrestle with that and come to, a, a, you know, one one decision, one view, basically, and uh, and then engage with members about yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, thanks for that, Bill. That's uh, – um, I'm not sure that's – well, I, you know what, I think that in uh, learn, listen, and lead, um, the leadership part of the board's work is, uh, is distilling the whole process into, um, 
I, don't, I know this is sound a little dry, uh, policies, and yet there is a big conversation that happens, you know, above and around policies that the board wants to be able to speak to, uh, say, in a conversation or in a meeting, um, and, that, and that that is really um, the idea of having the board holism, this idea that, you know, we, we've, we, we've really come to a common place um, and can speak to this with one voice is really uh, so incredibly important. Um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for that, Bill. I kind of forgot about the, uh, we've got nine people going through a long multi-year process here, and we want to really, one of our goals is to, is, to, is to see it in a common way and be able to share the story in a common way. Mm -hmm. So, good. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, you know, in a way, I think that that really conjures up this, the, the whole essence of alignment, right? That if a, if a board can be successful doing that and, you know, whether it happened before a project emerged or during a project uh, that members are are uh, are included, um, uh, not so much in the leadership position, but in the in the ability to have a voice and input and just be able to be thinking about it with with the board and management. Um, you know, this alignment through the project to the future is is uh, it's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other things come up for you, Bill, when you think about the, of the alignment issue? Well, again, I, I think the alignment starts between board and general manager and uh, and then spreads from there, you know, from the board to the members and from the general manager to the staff. Uh, I'm sorry, say it again? The, the alignment spreads. It, it starts at the between board and general manager, uh -huh. and then the board uh, – seeks to be in alignment with the members uh -huh. and you know through dialogue and, and engagement and that the general man general manager then is has alignment at the management team level and with the with the full staff yeah mm -hmm. and then at that so then hopefully you have the full organization aligned in this direction to go forward yeah uh, Neat. But it's not like it's not like you start out on day one and go to the staff and say, "Okay, staff, what do you think we should do?" And go to the I mean, the initial work is done at the leadership level between board and general manager, in, in my view. And uh, certainly, the board might ask the general manager to take a leading a leading role in helping shape the direction, subject to you know. Uh, Reporting to critique by approval by the board. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. And on the other end of the spectrum, you'd have a manager who is able and willing to um, create plans that include input from members and others, and be then keeping the board in the loop and informing the board, and then they go down the road together driven that way as well. And there might have been a you know a survey done of uh you know a customer survey done and a member survey might have done of you know, getting uh -huh. input. Uh -huh. You know, th those are valuable tools. Right. I'm not saying you ignore ignore the members or you ignore the staff. <laughs> no. No? <laughs> no. Okay. Let's go to uh control, delegate and evaluate. And um so these these three words um, uh, are are very much connected to the idea of having uh, criteria that we authorize and empower. So uh, control would be criteria, expectations, um, policies. Delegate would be authorize, empower, um, um, and then evaluate is the idea of of, of judging. Uh, per performing our our judgment role as a board, and um, this question, uh, if if you already have stuff written down, a great place to start when you wonder how you are controlling or delegating or evaluating, is to ask what have we already said about this, and um, uh, that will really help inform 
the process when you get to the place of, of seeing that expansion projects kind of by definition come with uh, a series of key decision points, um, they really ought not be surprises. You can look at them in advance and say, gee, I bet, you know, at some point we're going to be having a contract with um, a key service provider or needing to sign a lease or needing to take out a mortgage or I don't know, what are some of those other decision points, Bill, that come up? I think you covered a, a lot of them there, but I mean, a, you know, a lease agreement, uh, you know, financing agreements, um, agreements with architect with contractors and those are major major contracts and if they're in each board needs to work through how are those decisions to be made and uh, you know some people might argue that say the board can delegate those decisions to management and and I might respond by saying I don't think the board's going to be adequately engaged in taking ownership of a project if they if, they, if that's the case. Um, so yeah, and then we would then you would arm wrestle. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the point is to actually um, uh, talk about the reality of going through a multi-year project and being real about what some of those decisions are going to be, and then uh, and then clarify how our decisions going to be made and what have we already said about this and at what level is the board going to be in control and at what level is delegation taking place and then in my mind uh, you know evaluation and the judging uh, needs to just be at the highest level uh, rigorous level uh, at all stages no matter who's uh, responsible mm -hmm. cool um, and I've got some slides in here. We're not going to spend a lot of time going through uh, the idea of the policies and the criteria, but that, you know, in the policy governance structure, the, the question of why we would do every, anything uh, is answered in, in an organization's ENDS policies. They, they really are meant to address uh, what results we expect of the organization, not what projects we have rolling out, but what should come of those projects. Um, and these, these questions really are resulting from that upper circle that we were demonstrating before. And, um, and I just can't emphasize enough the idea that a board, you know, could and should be thinking and talking about the future of the co-op in a way that allows for your ends policies to, to very much reflect um, the conditions that you um, uh, hope to influence in the future uh, with regards to your community and your members. Um, the executive limitation policies are really key in, in this whole process. They, uh, in particular, three that, uh, three that really end up being involved are your planning policy, your financial conditions policy, your asset protection policy. And, um, the planning policy uh, would be saying, hey, manager, it's not okay if you don't have plans, and in fact might go on to say a few things about uh, what might be expected of, of the planning process. Um, financial conditions and activities um, is going to be talking about really where we're going to draw the line around, uh, around financial conditions of the co-op. And then the interesting thing is that the planning policy is uh, usually connected to the financial conditions policy so that when a uh, manager is, say, uh, making these one to, to five year plans that uh, uh, Bill is saying a, a project very well might uh, encompass, that the plans for the financial conditions of the co-op would actually be included in that uh, planning process. That it's not like we well we should be aware of you know what our what our um, expected future financial conditions will be given the projects that are unfolding right and bill i mean that uh um, i mean you work with with managers on on creating the pro formas how many years out do they tend to go um 
We're doing the most all in 10 years out now. Mm -hmm. So managers are involved in, in, you know, doing their best at creating a one to five to 10 year financial model and your a board's executive limitation policies are going to be um, not only talking about constraining and having expectations around current uh, financial conditions, but also planned for um, financial conditions. So oh, here comes a question. Bill, what happens when a big unexpected oops happens? <laughs> uh, they, all, they often do. They often do. Uh, yeah. So being flexible uh, is, is important. Um, you know, you're not carving things in stone as you're going along here. And and then in your budgeting process to be conservative and to also to provide for an overrun allowance. And, and typically we when we initially cost out a project, we initially put on a 15% overrun allowance and then once everybody gets all the costs figured out, uh, they want to say, "Let's okay, let's cut that. We know all the costs. We're going to cut, take that overrun allowance down to to four percent." And you know, I say, "No, you can't take it any lower than ten percent." So, you know, continuing to have a sizable overrun allowance is is important. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I I like um, flexibility, and then I also like just going back to that idea of commitment and alignment. You know, and if we're conjuring up this idea of being in a development culture, even if it's just for one project, um, stuff happens, and and that idea of commitment actually gets tested uh, when we have the oops, right? And kind of kind of need to talk about, uh, hey, I bet we'll have some oops here in this process as we move forward. Uh, let's let's uh, let's let's create relationships that uh, where commitment can. Um, can you know withstand the challenges? Yeah, and the the whole the whole process through the four stages is a test of your organization, and it's a healthy test uh, because if you can't get through these tests, clear these hurdles, get through the barriers, you're not going to be able to be successful in the new door. So, if you have an oops, and and it's it's just the universe's way of helping you out. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, so so it was a good thing, um, and these these last two are really important. The uh, the the policy areas uh, regarding how the board structures its relationship with management, and how the board has defined its own role. Um, to to me, and and to, and and to start with this this uh, the board process. How have we defined our role? Not only that, but what agreements have we made about how we're going to do our job? And um, talking about this, being really having that good, honest uh, set of uh, agreements um, really is helpful later when people have such a – could have such a, a range of, of how they might respond um, in, a, in, a, in a set of circumstances. That if you if you've developed the um, the the board's process um, strongly in the beginning, I think that it it really helps as you go through the dynamic time of you know you're trying to do stuff and it's not always turning out and people have a wide range of opinion about what should be done and and um, I mean you know just for example the the whole idea of judging management's work based on what's reasonable as opposed to what a particular director might really like to see happen, all right? Um, that to me is, uh, is, is kind of a watershed idea that, that are we gonna have a, a board process that where we really spend our time creating a group think based on what's reasonable or we're gonna have the wild, wild west and have our group process go in any direction based on what people think ought to be going on. Uh, no, it's it's uh, it's tricky to talk about it in the abstract, but when you see it in real life, it's really um, there's a huge difference between the two two versions of uh, a board process. And Bill, I'm sure you've seen them all. Oh yes, I've seen them quite a few of them anyway. Um, and that board GM relations um, agreements really is about what's the deal that we have, 
between the board and the manager as they go through not only the expansion process but just day to day um, day to day business. Really, really important, um, simple idea to have uh, clearly established. Um, this next thing here, we don't need to spend any time on. Um, this is just. We, a, we just have a couple minutes left here. Yeah, just right? have a couple minutes left, and then we talked about that. Um, oh, some of the known challenges. Just to rattle these off, these things take longer than you might imagine. They cost more money than you might imagine. They bring up a lot of issues about money. Um, requires a realistic look at organizational readiness. Puts major new demands on the organization. Um, management transition and manager burnout, something that's, I don't know, it happens, right, Bill? And it's sad when that happens. What have, what have, what careers have, have people gone on to after they've been burned out as being a co-op manager through an expansion process? Bagging groceries. Bagging groceries, yeah. Um, board transitions, board burnout, confusion. These are all things that, you know, want to pay attention to early on. Bill, how often can people celebrate when they're in an expansion process? Daily, Mark. Daily. Daily. Daily or hourly, uh, one of those two. Uh, I, I mean, for the co-op to be positioned to be considering an expansion and then if it decides to pursue it, uh, that's that's to be in a good position. And, uh, you know, to celebrate what has brought you there and uh, there's going to be a lot of work to get through the process. You need to have fun and have a meet time together. And... Uh, Celebration and support and praise are yeah. very important pieces. Yeah. Um, great comment from from Tom. This elevates the importance of the board member linkage. Totally right. Uh, please have your boards thinking that they are there to distill and really work hard on representing the owner members, and yet the board has to take the lead and really work hard on what that means. Um, so thank you for that. And Dave, I just um, I have that story in my head about a, a member asking the question, and uh, I'll write it down sometime. <laughs> hey, you all have been a great audience. I want to um, uh, tell you that when we end the webinar, a uh, webinar survey is going to come up. We really appreciate your feedback. Uh, it helps us uh, helps us improve.